I can, invite you back to your chairs and to open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2. Titus is almost to the end of the Bible, not quite. <laughs> on my Bible, Titus chapter 2 is on page 998. No idea if that's where it is on your Bible, but it's somewhere in the upper numbers. Well, I wanted to tell you something before I get started with the message that has absolutely nothing to do with my message. Um, so this is not an intro. This is just a, a story that I thought you would enjoy. So this morning I was getting ready, and my daughter Ellie was there, and she threw out a question, Daddy, how, how do you think your, your message is coming? <laughs> and I said, well, I mean, good, I hope, honey. And she said, well, even if it isn't, the worst thing that could happen is people would think you're a bad pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, that's not really the worst thing that could happen to you. It's like, well, that's funny and true, I guess. <laughs> Hope that's not a premonition. <laughs> All right, now here's the real intro for the message, okay? I was reading, um, or I, I caught my eye an article, it's an older article, uh, in The Economist. I don't read The Economist, don't be impressed. I just caught the article title. Uh, but I caught this title. It said, Knockoffs Catch On. Very clever. Knockoffs Catch On. Fake goods are proliferating to the dismay of companies and governments. Went on to say, Fake Porsches and Ferraris zoom along the streets of Bangkok. A German bank has discovered an ersatz gold ingot made of tungsten in its reserves. According to a German television channel investigating persistent reports that many of the world's financial institutions have been similarly hoodwinked. NASA, it says, America's space agency has even bought suspect materials. There's a rise of counterfeits in the world, counterfeit products that claim to be the real thing, but they are not. They claim to be the genuine article, but they are not. And I think a topic in our theology, in our thinking, where there are an abundance of counterfeits is the topic of grace and obedience. It is a challenging topic. It is difficult, and that's why I think there are a lot of counterfeit ways of thinking about it out there. Ways of thinking about grace and obedience, that topic in combination, that make it maybe easier to understand, simpler, that paint a one-sided picture of the biblical testimony, that don't represent the Bible accurately, but present it in such a compelling, motivating, attractive way that you think, that sounds good to me, I'll go with that. They're counterfeits. Many counterfeits on the topic of grace and obedience. As you know, we, we were taking a pause in our series in Acts to talk about this subject of grace and legalism from a number of different angles. We talked about uh, grace and legalism in the Old Testament, grace and legalism in our relationship with God last week, and this week, grace and legalism and obedience. How do we think rightly about grace and legalism and obedience, and how do we avoid a counterfeit understanding. We don't want to be hoodwinked by a counterfeit view. So what I'd like to do is read from the book of Titus. This is a letter from Paul to his son in the faith, Titus, and it summarizes in a very helpful way what many passages of the New Testament scriptures say along these lines. Let's read that together. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. 
Now, I'm not going to examine everything about this passage, but I, but I, I trust that the, the weight of the teaching here is transparent. It's a fairly straightforward passage. And I might summarize this, uh, this motivation in this passage and a number of others this way. I might say this, saving grace always leads to Christ-centered godliness. Saving grace always leads to Christ-centered godliness. Actually, you can see from this passage that is the intention of grace. One intention was to result in a people who are freed from all lawlessness and to, that the Lord Jesus would purify for himself, in verse 14, a people for his own possession who are, listen to this, zealous for good works. And yet, it's the grace of God that trains us to do those things. So there is this delightful, sometimes confusing, often counterfeited juxtaposition where the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation, and what result does it have? Well, it trains us, in verse 12, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age with our eyes fixed towards heaven and the coming of the Lord Jesus who gave himself for us to produce in us a righteousness that he would delight in. It's delightfully juxtaposed, isn't it? Grace appears and what it, does it do in us? Well, it trains us to renounce ungodliness and to live zealous for good works. And this is just one example. There are many, many passages. If you read the New Testament, these passages abound. The great passage about uh, that we're saved by grace alone in, in Ephesians chapter 2 concludes by saying that God has prepared works in advance that we should walk in them. Or you have the wonderful passages in, in Romans that state that we're saved by faith alone, in Christ alone. And then Paul goes on to say, do not use your freedom to serve in the flesh, but you are now slaves of righteousness. So the, the scriptures are unashamedly presenting to us grace alone, and that grace has the effect of producing an obedient people. Saving grace always, always, without exception, always, necessarily of divine purpose, and God always accomplishes what he purposes to do, always leads to a Christ-centered godliness. Always. Always, without exception. There is no exception in God's economy. No exception. You think of it, for example, like a fruit tree. You give this, give this analogy. A fruit tree is a certain kind of tree, whether you see the fruit or not. It is a certain kind of tree. That is an orange tree, whether you see oranges on it or not. When we were in Arizona, we planted, we had a lemon tree in the backyard, and it hadn't been well tended to. So for years, though it was a lemon tree, it produced no lemons. It was metaphorically a lemon, lemon tree. It was a lemon tree. It produced no lemons, and I didn't plan that, okay? So I don't plan those kind of things. So forgive me if they just come popping out somewhere. So it's, it was a lemon tree, but it didn't produce any lemons. Well, in God's economy, there is no such thing as a fruit tree that doesn't produce fruit. God doesn't have barren trees. God doesn't have barren Christians. Now, the fruit that it produces didn't make it a lemon tree, but it did reveal it to be a lemon tree. And in God's economy, there are no barren trees, so necessarily the grace of God that created us as Christians does produce the fruit of good works. Christ-centered godliness. That's the summary. Now, I think there's, as I said, many counterfeits to this teaching. I want to walk through three questions that I hope help us to kind of get into the, some of the nuances of how we could think about this. And this is a tricky topic, so I hope you kind of bear with me as we walk through some of these things. All right, first of all, first question. First question to kind of zero in, hone our skills in identifying counterfeits and seeing the genuine article. First, what is the difference between grace and license? First question, what is the difference between grace and license? And you can see the value of that, can't you? If we're saved by grace alone, if God's grace covers all of our sins, past, present, and future, then what is the difference between grace and a license to sin? What difference does it make? Or as Paul asked rhetorically in Romans, why not go on sinning that grace may increase? If we really are saved by grace alone, does it really make any difference whether we obey? What difference does it make? What is the difference between grace and license? Well, 
we might ask that question a few different ways. See if this resonates with you. We might say, what does it matter if I sin, if my record is truly transferred to Jesus and his to me? Isn't a true belief in grace functionally the license to sin? If we focus on grace, does it really matter if we concern ourselves with sin? The answer is that the Bible simply refuses to be manipulated by this question. It refuses to be. The scriptures are clear that none of our works, past, present, or future, are added to Jesus as our justification before God. We are saved by Christ alone. The Bible also says without a hint of apology that the God who saves us by grace gives us no freedom to be indifferent towards sin, to see sin as irrelevant, or to see godliness as only the calling of a select few Christians. Unapologetically, it says both of those things, often in the same passage. Often in the, in the same passage. The grace that saves us also transforms our nature and our perspective and sets us on a journey in which we are progressively turned away from sin and toward holiness. We are saved from wrath, set apart to godliness, saved both from the wrath of God and from the bondage of sin and lawlessness that was our lifestyle in Jesus. Now, normally, normally, where this counterfeit idea that grace is license usually works in is, is, is more functionally. We functionally focus on grace in a way that acts as though the Bible doesn't speak both of those things without apology. Functionally, we, we talk about grace and we're very uncomfortable with discussions of obedience. Or we might be uncomfortable coming across a passage about being zealous for good works or living self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. We, we tend to be uncomfortable with those, so we might, we might prefer a diet of grace-only passages and call ourselves more of a gospel-centered Christian if we think that way. But that is simply not the way the Bible preaches. It's not the way the Bible speaks. Let me give you a quote from a book I would highly recommend. A man who absolutely is committed to justification by faith alone, agrees with us about grace alone, in Christ alone, but has done an excellent job of examining what the Bible actually says about holiness. And in some cases, it is uncomfortable. It's difficult for us. I would highly recommend this man, almost anything this man writes is outstanding. His name is Kevin DeYoung. He writes in a book called The Hole in Our Holiness, The Hole in Our Holiness, and he says this, not only is holiness the goal of your redemption, listen to this, it is necessary, very carefully chosen word, it is necessary for your redemption. Notice he doesn't say the basis of or the essence of, but it is necessary for your redemption. Now he says, before you sound the legalist alarm and tie me up by my own moral bootstraps and feed my carcass to the Galatians, we should see what Scripture has to say. <laughs> it's the consistent and frequent teaching of the Bible that those whose lives are marked by habitual, very important word, ungodliness, will not go to heaven. To find acquittal from God on the last day, there must be, listen to this, evidence flowing out of us that grace has flowed into us. Because God creates no barren trees. There must be divine necessity, evidence flowing out of us, of the grace that has flowed into us. Fruit, godliness, not the basis of our salvation, but the evidence of it, the necessary evidence of it. Here's a couple of examples of saying what, exactly what he's saying, that we need to feel the weight of. Scripture te teaches as an entire council. It doesn't give us selected scriptures that are our preference. So, for example, in 1 Corinthians 6, it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, there's a huge category, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Or an even more comprehensive verse in Hebrews 12 says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So what is the difference between grace and license? Well, the grace that is the real grace of God always produces a holiness, and that holiness is the necessary, in God's design, the necessary evidence of those who are truly his. So we can either 
base our justification on our righteousness, nor can we dismiss it as though it's irrelevant. It is the necessary evidence. And you want to notice de Young's word habitual. This is not an occasion of sin. This is not a moment of sin. This is looking at your life as a whole and saying, is there fruit in my life that gives evidence that the grace of God that creates no barren trees has produced in me righteousness growing, maybe small, maybe almost barely noticeable, but growing righteousness, a growing trajectory towards godliness and holiness, a growing zeal towards good works. Is that fruit in me? And if you look and say, I don't see that fruit anywhere, then these scriptures appropriately come along and say, have you understood truly the grace of God? License is a counterfeit of grace. It attempts to draw a conclusion that the Bible does not draw. Let me say it this way. License says this. Since salvation is by grace alone, we are free to sin as we please. The Bible does not say that. Ever. Scripture says, since salvation is by grace alone, we are transformed into the likeness of the one who saved us. That's the way the Bible speaks. License claims to be, uh, really protect the purity of grace. It claims to be protecting grace. But actually, it's abandoning the authority of the scriptures, which is the only basis we have for trusting grace. A few years ago, and actually still present today, uh, there was a growing teaching that said that focusing on God's commands in Scripture, preaching them, for example, calling Christians to obey them, uh, or even focusing on our obedience, was a danger to the nature of salvation by grace alone. It was a, a growing teaching. Don't talk to Christians about the commands of Scripture. Talk to them about justification, and their obedience will organically come out. It's not something they need to be focused on. The problem with that teaching is that's simply not true to the Bible. Paul is unashamedly willing to talk about our obedience, to call us to obey. Jesus is willing to call us to obey, to even say shocking things like, if you will not forgive your brother, your heavenly father will not forgive you. So we've got to put that into our theology and say, no, my forgiveness doesn't merit me salvation, but it is the necessary evidence that I have been forgiven by God and received the saving and transforming grace of Jesus Christ. Look at, look at the, the next chapter. It makes this point explicitly. It puts these two things together. Titus chapter 3, uh, look down there at verse 4. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, and we like that phrase. That sounds like a great phrase. The goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, good news, but according to his own mercy and by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to do what? To devote themselves to good works. That's the way the Bible speaks. That's the way the whole New Testament speaks. Talk about justification and then make it clear that that should result in a zeal for good works. And because God is sovereign, it will result in a zeal for good works. A Christian who loves the grace of God can and should and will simultaneously love the topic of obeying God, of hating sin, of passion for good works, and of a determination to increasingly live for God's glory, doing all of this grounded in the salvation that is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. First counterfeit, license is not the grace of God. Second question, to get to another counterfeit, what is the difference between obedience and legalism? What is the difference between obedience and legalism? Okay, you've convinced me. The Bible talks about obedience, but I'm scared because the Bible has all these passages condemning legalism. And Paul practically screams this way through the book of Galatians, denouncing those people for abandoning the gospel and trusting in their works. So how, if I, if I want to obey and I see the value of obedience, how do I know whether I'm obeying in the right way or whether I'm being a legalist and trusting in my obedience? I mean, have you ever had that person question personally? I'm experiencing conviction right now. Is this good conviction because I should obey and I should hate sin? Or is this the kind of condemnation I'm not supposed to feel because I'm supposed to trust Jesus? Have you ever had that experience? I've had it all the time. Okay, am I, is this 
Legalism or, I mean, maybe I shouldn't feel conviction at all. Or, or maybe I should, but I don't know which is which. What is the difference between obedience and legalism? Isn't that a question that comes to our minds? What is the difference? Is it just there's some people who really love obeying and they're also kind of legalists? And there's some people who really love the grace of God and they're also kind of disobedient? And we just kind of meld the church together between the two of them and work it all out? Holiness people go to holiness classes, grace people go to grace classes, and somehow you put them in the same care group, and by the end of the night, you'll have gotten a good counsel from both. <laughs> no, 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 no. The Bible is much clearer that it helps us more than that. Let me, let me talk about some specific types of legalism counterfeits to help us discern what is legalism, which is a counterfeit obedience. Listen to this. Obedience is not legalism. Obedience is not Legalism, but legalism represents itself as obedience, and so we need to become skillful at identifying the difference. Let me give you four different types of legalism. I'll, I'll go through them quickly. Four different types. First of all, merit legalism. This is the easiest one to spot. Everybody references this. Merit legalism. It's trusting, explicitly trusting in your obedience as being the basis of God's love for you and the ground of his promises to save you. It turns over your obedience into a substitute for Jesus. I must go to this particular church, and that is the reason God will save me. God looks at my good deeds, and he counts me as able to get into heaven. Or you might talk to a neighbor that says, why will God let you into heaven? I am better than most people. That's merit legalism. And whatever good works have been done in that direction is not obedience. According to Paul, it is an abomination worthy to be cursed. To claim that my obedience is a good substitute or a good addition to the finished righteousness of Jesus Christ. Merit obesium. E easy to spot. Most Christians, if they had good teaching, will say, now I know my obedience doesn't save me. And they'll throw that in. I'm, I'm not a merit legalist. So they, they get that counterfeit. Let's, let's move on to counterfeit number two. Maturity legalism much more insidious. Maturity legalism. This is the belief that our maturity functionally, functionally, is what draws God's love toward us and our ongoing immaturity or sin causes God to withdraw his love from us or perhaps even question his decision to save us. Maturity legalism. The belief that our maturity, or our lack of maturity, is the functional measurement of God's current love towards us. God's current commitment toward us. We believe in Jesus. We confess his name. There has been a record of some growth in our life, but currently we see some area or a significant amount of immaturity in our life, and we assume God's love is withdrawn or minimized, and maybe even he's second-guessing whether this was a good bargain. I know very mature Christians who, who functionally have that thought, man, I, I'm not sure I'm paying out for God. I, I think my Christian life was supposed to sort of give evidence of what a good investor he was. And I, I don't think I've been a real good return. And so maybe he's questioning. And maybe even he's questioning so much that he should pull out, cut his losses, and move on. Now, many Christians would never say this kind of thing, but functionally, most Christians feel that way at some point or another. That is counterfeit. That is counterfeit obedience. God's love toward us is never diminished by our immaturity. It is never increased by our maturity. Is God pleased when we sin? No, he's not. But the lack of pleasure in sin is not the angry justice judgment of God. It is the kind, loving, affectionate displeasure of a father who does bring conviction to children when they are doing that which is dangerous to them and dishonoring to him. And that love is directed towards us often in discipline and affection, which as Hebrew says, is painful at the time but not pleasant. But there's a big difference between loving discipline and angry punishment. So our maturity is never, is never the measurement of God's love towards us or his commitment to us to continue to work in our souls, to change us into the image of his son. 
It's the second thoughts lie. God's having second thoughts about me. It's a counterfeit. Third, we'll do briefly, Moses legalism. Poor Moses. Moses is such a great guy. I, I mean nothing against Moses, and Moses would agree with me what I'm about to say. So Moses legalism, we talked about a few weeks ago, it, it's the attempt to use the Old Testament scriptures and patterns without reference to the coming of Christ. The Old Testament is God's word. It has things in it that we are to obey explicitly and some we're to obey uh, in a fulfillment sense before Christ. We are to obey it as God's word, but not in a way that discounts what the New Testament says about Christ coming and fulfilling the purpose of the law. Most obvious example is circumcision, which is referenced in Acts 15. Even if we didn't trust in this, listen to this, even if we didn't trust in this act for salvation, but we only saw it as an act of necessary obedience, it would still be legalism. See the difference? So in Acts chapter 15, when Paul's talking to these people, he's saying, no, no, they're demanding that you be circumcised. And there might have been people, I don't know, there might have been people who, who were, were saying, look, I, I know they're saved by Jesus, but this is necessary obedience. Maybe it's similar to, you might think of it as similar to somebody saying, well, oh, you know, not murdering, that is a necessary obedience. It doesn't save you, it's not meritorious, but it is necessary, it's a necessary fruit. And there are elements of Moses legalism where people pick things out of the Old Testament and say, this is necessary obedience that the scripture explicitly says, no, it's not. Now, there's some things that are vague and some things that are very clear. No, it is not necessary obedience to build a new temple. No, it is not necessary obedience to be circumcised. No, it is not necessary obedience to offer sacrificial lambs. No, it is not. Not only is it not meritorious, it is not necessary obedience. It is Moses' legalism. Fourth, Man-made legalism. I think this is even worse than the third counterfeit. Man-made legalism. This is an attempt to consider certain practices as having the same authority as the scriptures. This is not obedience. This is not higher spirituality. This is legalism. An attempt to consider certain practices as having a higher or equal authority to the scriptures. That is legalism. We do it, all of us do this, go for this counterfeit all the time. So let's say, for example, that you have a, a principle that is clear in God's word, that a Christian should read God's word. Now that's obedience. But you've established a certain pattern, a certain practice, that a Christian should read God's word at a specific time of day. And that to not do that practice is automatically the same kind of disobedience as not reading God's word. And it begins to equate. And not only should they read God's word at a specific time of day, they should have a certain percentage between prayer and reading. And a certain percentage between prayer, reading, and meditation. And a certain percentage between prayer, reading, meditation, and the reading of other books. And subtly, practices that may be wise and helpful and valuable applications of an obedience principle begin to be equated with God's word. Let's think about food. It happens with food all the time, especially in the present day. We should eat to the glory of God. Command, obedience. I know certain foods are more healthy than other foods, therefore it is disobedient to eat those foods. Hmm. That might be wise for you. That might be a good stewardship of the information God's given you, but that is legalism if you equate it that way. We should not put before our eyes any ungodly thing. Absolutely, obedience. Therefore, I know that any rating of a certain type automatically means I'm putting before my eyes an ungodly thing. Mm, and legalism. Might it be sinful for a person to watch a particular movie that had that rating? Certainly, that might be putting before their eyes an ungodly thing. Certainly it might be. 
but to create a practice and to equate it with the explicit teaching of God's word and to discern and to decide that this practice is obedience. There is no other way you can obey. Legalism, it's counterfeit. Man-made legalism. Often this type of legalism is a blend of the other two or it might be totally self-created. Usually, man-made legalism is focused on some external practice that is not explicitly required of us, that may or may not be a wise application, but that in and of itself is not obedience and actually by itself does nothing to put to death the sin in our hearts. That's the other danger about counterfeit legalism. It usually trusts a certain external practice as if in following that practice we're becoming more like Jesus. Whereas Paul makes the point that, look, external regulations, if they're extra scriptural regulations, do nothing to change the cravings and desires and idolatry in our hearts. So might they be helpful and useful to a Christian to decide I'm not going to do such and such a practice because every time I do, I give in to sin? Certainly. Might it be helpful for a Christian to discern their particular weaknesses and strengths such that to not eat this thing or go this place or do this kind of practice? I'm not going to do that for me. That is to put me in a temptation uh, spot where I often sin. Sure, excellent wisdom. Do that. Be practical. Godliness is not some metaphorical, you know, metaphysical idea that I'm just godly even though I, I sin in all kinds of practical ways. Yes, be practical. Be practical in your obedience, but don't equate those practices with the teaching of God's word. That's legalism. In contrast to all types of legalism, true obedience reads all of the scriptures in light of Christ, refuses to trust in itself for salvation, refuses to add to the commands of scripture, but views the authority of the Lord in what he does command as for our good and our joy and progressive sanctification as our calling in Christ. Jerry Bridges, in probably my favorite book about this topic, Transforming Grace, which I know many of you have read. If you haven't, you should. Under, but it's not, you don't have to, okay? You don't have to, it's not obedient. <laughs> I'm recommending it. Under a sense of legalism, obedience is done with a view to meriting salvation or God's blessing on our lives. Under grace, obedience is a loving response to salvation already provided in Christ and the assurance that having provided salvation, God will also through Christ provide all else that we need. Now, the reason I reference the man-made legalism as well is I, I do think it's, it's very possible for Christians in a church like ours to assume that merit legalism is the only kind. And it's just not. It's not. that There are moments. Circumcision is a great example where Paul essentially says this practice is not necessary obedience, or he says it elsewhere about the food offered to idols. Same thing. He said, no, no, this, this isn't a necessary obedience for you. You are free, so to speak, to not obey that regulation. Or he says it in Colossians, referencing special days and, and Sabbaths and feast days. He says, that, look, th these are a shadow of the things to come. Or he says it when he's talking in the pastorals about there are some who say, do not touch, do not taste, do not eat. But he's saying, look, th th these regulations are not necessary obedience. Now, if you can't do those things without sinning, well, then surely for you, don't do those things. But don't equate them with an explicit command of the Bible. Instead, obey Obey. There is so much in the scriptures that we should obey. I think sometimes we create lists because they're easier to follow than the full list of actual commands that are in the Bible. Or even just this one, love your neighbor as yourself. Real obedience refuses to be bound by any man-made regulation, but it regulates every moment by the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not content with merely external obedience, but it looks to root out the attitudes of the heart. We need to discern the difference between grace and license and obedience and legalism, but I think there is still one more counterfeit in this area that endangers us. Third question. What difference does Christ make in the Christian life? What difference does Christ make in the Christian life? And that might be a, okay, 
really obvious question to ask, but I don't think it's obvious functionally. What difference does Christ make in the Christian life? Another way that grace and obedience is counterfeit is by functionally removing the person of Jesus Christ from the center focus in our Christian life. Notice in Titus how Christ-centered this passage is. Notice that. The grace of God has appeared. It trains us to live this way. And then notice immediately in verse 13, what are we doing as we're living this way? Where are our eyes focused as we're living this way? As we're doing self-control and not giving into worldly passions and living upright. What are we doing? Verse 13, we're waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And notice the personal nature of verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify, listen to this, for himself, a people for his own possession. Here's what I think happens sometimes. We sometimes turn justification into a status, a legal status, and godliness into a lifestyle, which is true as far as it goes, but we fail to see both as gifts of our Savior himself, that we are united to him. We are justified in him. Let me, let me, let me say it this way. When you think about justification, which I know many of you have been taught well about justification, our righteous standing in Christ, do you think of it as a legal record only or as a legal record that you have because you are inside of your union with Jesus Christ? Is it a legal record that he has filed in heaven so it is secure Or is it his own personal righteousness presented to God that you have by virtue of union with him? The one record way of thinking about it, it's not wrong, it's just incomplete. It lacks the personal connection to Jesus Christ. And the other danger is it separates justification from sanctification, our growing holiness. You see the importance of Christ in the Christian life. Otherwise, we think of this as a status and a lifestyle, and we separate it both from the person of Jesus Christ. Christians succumbing to this counterfeit might begin to think of the key to life, see if you think this way, as a kind of balance, just enough obedience, but not too much, just enough trust, but not too much. I'm justified, but I should also obey. Some Christians might feel they have struck the right kind of balance, and so they feel comfortable. Others might find that an internal argument leaves them forever off balance. If I trust too much, maybe I'm not obeying enough. If I obey too much, maybe I'm not trusting enough. They live constantly off balance, uncertain. And some Christians might even feel like that off balance state is what God wants me to be. Because that keeps us safe. It's like riding a bike. If you lean too far in this way, lean back towards obedience. If you lean too far towards grace, lean back towards don't, don't, don't just keep it, keep it balanced. So I feel uncomfortable if I don't feel like I'm constantly about to topple over. What is lacking from that perspective is the person of Jesus Christ, who is our righteousness and our shepherd leading us to sanctification. Amen. Simultaneously. Simultaneously, he is both our righteousness, unchanged, unspotted, in the heavens, unremovable, and he is the one who through his spirit is transforming us into his image. When we look to him, not in some, again, metaphysical way as if he's not the justifier, he's just some some feeling kind of God we're supposed to feel about. No, no, he is the one who justifies us, but he is also the one who sanctifies us. The other challenge of thinking in terms of status and lifestyle is that it it tends to make Christianity all about how we are evaluating ourselves rather than turning ourselves over to the ultimate judgment and loving kindness of our Lord. Because it's up to me to discern whether I'm getting this balance right or not. And frankly, many Christians I know, you're just never sure. I hope I'm not missing some obedience but I hope I'm not being a legalist either. You're just never sure. Rather than in turning this truth over to Christ, knowing in him, he is our justification and he does change us and he does call us to obey, but he does that full of the power of his spirit and assuring us that he is with us always as we walk through this journey towards Zion. 
Justification is a status, but it's not just a status. It's a status we have in Christ. I remember a number of years ago talking to worship leaders about this and saying, you know, we have to be careful, guys. As we're talking, singing songs, we, we don't worship justification with many crowns. We don't worship our status. We worship Christ who justified us. Justification is, is intended to be a means of seeing the glory of what Christ did. It's not a glory in and of itself. Sanctification is a means of obeying our Lord. It's not a means of establishing the right kind of lifestyle. It's personal. It's relational. St. Clair Ferguson says it this way about union with Christ. He says, the benefits of the gospel are in Christ. They do not exist apart from him, and they are ours only in him. They cannot be abstracted from him as if we ourselves could possess them independently of him. I, I think you begin to feel the difference of that. Rather than wrestling, I don't, am I, you come to Christ and you say, I know you justify me, and would you please continue to convict me appropriately and help me to change? And leaving it to him, there is peace and zeal. There is peaceful zeal. Not anxious, worry, fretful, frantic obedience. There is peaceful, trusting, resting, passionate, zealous zeal. That is the Christian life. In the hands of our shepherd, peaceful, resting, passionate, zealous. And in trusting that to him and turning to him, we begin to see the difference. It's in light of fellowship with him that we begin to discern where we're being legalistic and where we're being disobedient. Trying to figure that on our own as if we're out of fellowship with him and we're figuring it out way out on some road on the highway, trying to follow the right sign is the wrong metaphor for the Christian life. So what difference does Christ make in the Christian life? He makes all the difference. Not just in getting us to heaven, but along the way. He makes all the difference. Your daily life is meant to be lived in fellowship with Jesus Christ. That's why in John 15, he says, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. That's not just a status. That's an ongoing experience. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. And if you abide in him, you are clean because of his justification. And if you abide in him, you will hate sin. And if you abide in him, you will love godliness. And if you abide in him, you will hate legalism. And if you abide in him, he will keep you strong to the end and will present you blameless at the day of his return. Christ is the ongoing key. Not just Christ the doctrine. Christ the Savior, the Lord, the justifier the shepherd, the king. He in himself is the composite of all that we have received from God. In him we have every blessing. In him we have every calling. He is our righteousness and our wisdom and our sanctification, as Paul says to the Corinthians. Grace and obedience is not just a balanced way of viewing the Christian life. It is the obvious way to view life when our eyes are set on the Lord, on his return, on his glory, and the revelation of the power of his salvation. If you want a book that helps press in this direction, it's a, it's a little bit of a challenging read, but Sinclair Ferguson's The Whole Christ is what I would recommend. If, if you especially are someone that lives with that constant argument where you feel like I'm constantly off balance, I'm trying to decide whether I have just enough grace or just enough obedience, and I think this is the way God wants me to be, read Transforming Grace or read The Whole Christ. It will help you. But most importantly, go to Christ as your shepherd and your justifying savior and let him give you the commands that he says are gentle and you will find rest for your souls. Saving grace always, always results in a Christ-centered obedience. Don't be afraid of the obedience passages in Scripture. They are the gift of a loving Father who knows that His law and His purposes are always good and always result in our ultimate joy. And don't assume that if you love those passages, you must not be a grace-loving Christian because it's the same grace that comes from the same Savior who died for our sins, showing to us how despicable they are, but also paid for them in full and then brought us into relationship with God so that in him we can know the joy of holiness and the peace of forgiveness at the same time. Saving grace always results in a Christ-centered obedience. Keeping our eyes on him 
We will not dare to trust our works or attempt to add to his word in legalism, nor will we dare to see license to rebellion as a legitimate response to his grace. We are united to Christ by his spirit, set apart and called to glory. Christ makes all the difference in discerning the counterfeit between license and grace, legalism and obedience. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to pray specifically for Christians who feel like they are constantly anxious, never at rest, can't discern the difference between conviction and condemnation, feel constantly foggy, and most importantly, feel distant from you. Lord, would you right now, by your Spirit, draw near to them? Lord, give them the assurance of your salvation that is by grace alone, that you love them in spite of all of their immaturity, Lord, help us to be those that don't turn your grace into some sort of license to sin, but that we would love you and love obeying you and see your law and your glory as good and glorious gifts to us. That part of the gift of your salvation is freeing us from the slavery of sin. Lord, you are a good master. You are a good king. You are a saving king. It is good to obey you. It is good to live for your glory. It is good to hear your voice as our shepherd and to come. It is good to hear you calling us away from sin. It is good to love reflecting your glory in our relationships. It is good to trust you when we would rather be anxious in our flesh. It is good to call out for your Holy Spirit to produce the fruit of your own character in us. It is good that you have given us those things in yourself. It is a good fight against sin that you have set us to. And it is good that all of this is covered by your gracious salvation, paid for by your atoning blood. Make us a Christ-centered, grace-filled, obedient church. In Jesus' name, amen.